Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. I'm really excited today that we're joined by Sean Korn, our special guest. Sean Korn is an internationally acclaimed yoga teacher and public speaker known for her social activism, impassioned style of teaching, and raw, honest, and inspired self-expression. Over her 25-year teaching career, Sean has created many instructional DVDs, including her groundbreaking series, The Yoga of Awakening with Sounds True. Featured on over 40 magazine covers and countless media outlets, Sean has chosen to use her platform to bring awareness to global issues, including social justice, sex trafficking, HIV AIDS awareness, generational poverty, and animal rights. In 2005, our distinguished guest was named National Yoga Ambassador for Youth AIDS, and in 2013 received both the Global Green International Environmental Leadership Award and the Humanitarian Award by the Smithsonian Institute. Since 2007, Sean has been training leaders of activism through her co-founded organization, Off the Mat, Into the World. Sean also co-founded the Global Save a Challenge, which has raised over $3.5 million by activating communities of yoga and wellness in fund and awareness raising efforts. Today, Sean Korn is with Banyan Books in conversation about her book, Revolution of the Soul, Awaken to Love Through Raw Truth, Radical Healing, and Conscious Action. And the book just came out in paperback. In the book, Sean weaves together a raw and visceral account of her life story with some of the essential teachings on the path of yoga. She takes us from her hard partying days, tending bar and serving tables in New York City, where she was first drawn to yoga and delighted in its physical practices, through her move to LA, her journey in healing her own wounds, in becoming a yoga teacher and activist, and learning and growing into those roles through many hard-earned lessons. We get a vulnerable look at Sean's life and development, gleaning what the evolutionary journey of yoga might look like in our own lives. What shines throughout this book is Sean's dedication to truth and love. She doesn't claim to get it right all the time, but shows us how the path is a process of continuous self-reflection and refinement. We just have to stick with it. There are many really great quotes about this book from politicians, other teachers, uh, and celebrities, but I, I had to share this one from one of my favorite comedians, Larry David, who says this of Sean's book. Love this book. Like Sean herself, the message is direct, honest, funny, heartfelt, and filled with wisdom that can help all of us, except me, do better, be better, and work hard toward creating a healthier and more peaceful planet for all. If you'd like to learn more about today's honored guest, please visit her website, which is Sean with an E at the end, S E A N E corn.com. Banyan community, please join me in a warm welcome for Sean Corn. Sean, thank you so much for being here. 
Well, thank you so much for being here. I, I'm curious, did you actually write that uh, description of the book? I did. It, it, I was listening to it. I'm like, I've never heard that before. And prior to coming on, it's been, uh, I, I finished writing, the book was published September of 2019, right before the pandemic. And I went on a book tour uh, during that time, prior to the pandemic. And truth be told, I really haven't thought much. I haven't been in a situation where someone said to me, like, describe your book. And this morning I was thinking, like, how would I describe my book? It's been a long time since I've thought about that arc. And everything you just said, I was like, that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> you just absolutely across the board just hit every single bullet point. And I so I so appreciate that. Thank you very much. Oh, and I want to and I want to thank everybody. I can't see you all, but I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity again after uh, the past couple of years to be able to to share with you all about my book and to be in community in this way. So so thank you to everyone at Bending Books for making this possible. Oh, thank you so much, Sean. And and I just want to tell everybody that this is a really wonderful book. And you know, you, I, I, I personally, and I, I'm sure anybody reading it would see themselves in so many different parts of it. It's so, so truthful. Um, Sean, if it's okay with you, I wanted to just share a quote uh, that leads into a question. I pulled this, it's from towards the end of the book. Uh, and it says the following, from all of the angels who have crossed my path and enriched my heart, I have, lear I have learned that yoga is now. It's in every experience all beings, the rising of the sun, the shifting tides, the birth, the death, and every funky, wild, and weird moment in between. It is in the beautiful and in the grotesque. It's in the broken and the healed. It is in all souls emerging and all souls still asleep. Yoga is never an excuse to turn away from pain, discomfort, or suffering. It is an invitation to turn toward it with compassionate action. It is not a reason to bypass the heartbreak, either yours or the world's. It's so beautifully written. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about yoga as so much more beyond the physical aspect that it's known for and as a way of turning towards ourselves in our, in our fullness and all of life. Sure, I'm happy to. You know, it's, it's interesting when I hear my own words reflected back to me. You know, I'm like nodding in agreement as if someone else wrote it. And the, the thing is that when I, got in, when I got introduced to yoga, which I was pretty young, I was around 18 years old, um, there was a glamour about the practice. There was something magical, pure, um, profoundly intelligent, spiritual, of course. And I felt like none of those things. I was literally like dirty around the edges on every single level. And I felt like a fraud as if somehow my presence in that yoga space was inauthentic and unwelcomed. And it took me a really long time to get comfortable going into yoga spaces. I would wear the right clothing, put on the right oils, but internally feel like I was a visitor in a space that once they found out who the real me was, they would all rally together to get me out because my presence would have been toxic to that purity. That was something that as I got on the path, I became very committed to helping people to understand that the parts of us that we reject or deny are the very parts of us that need to be befriended because yoga teaches us that everything is interdependent. Everything is whole. Everything is about coming together in that unification. And if I'm rejecting any aspect of my humanity, including the parts that I do not like, then it will be impossible for me to be able to show up in love with you or with anybody when you're, you're not in your fullness, when you're broken, when you're scared or alone or in your shadow self. For the first, I'd say eight years of my experience with yoga, it was a purely physical experience. It was not spiritual at all. No matter what it looked like from the outside, all I was interested in was just being a little healthier. 
And I tolerated the spirituality, but it was not a priority for me. And then what happened one day, and I talk about it in the book, is that I had a very profound emotional experience while on the mat that took me by surprise. And it cracked me open and ripped out of me emotions that had been internalized because of my fear, limiting beliefs, control, all that stuff. But once it ripped out of me, I had, even though it was just a glimpse, I had a brief moment of feeling open, compassionate, and loving towards myself. And it helped me to look back and recognize that those eight years of the physical practice, it wasn't as if I um, was avoiding the spiritual practice. But the tension in my body was so armored out of self-preservation that it truly required eight years of extra push-ups to penetrate the tension so that I could finally feel what lived underneath that tension, which was both anger and grief. I couldn't get to those emotions until I broke through the tension. So those eight years were very purposeful as were then the many years after that, where my practice was all about my trauma, the mind-body connection, understanding the blockages that lived in my body as a result of, the, of what it is that I internalized. So what my point is, is that every single moment in our experience is significant. As I said in that quote, that yoga is now. It is in the heartbreak, it's in the loss, it's in the betrayal, it's in the devastation. It's also in the victory and in the joy and in the passion. There's not a single moment that excludes the practice of yoga because the practice is about liberation. And if we are fractured within ourselves, we can't move into that state of grace or wholeness until we come into a deeper relationship with all aspects of our being. And so I have been committed in my teaching and in my studentship not to pretend that you have to wear all white to be a yogi or you have to say all the sweet, pretty words. What I am suggesting is you've got to be real. And sometimes realness looks like yelling into a pillow, using every square, swear word imaginable, processing from your body the rage so it doesn't stay within feeling into your own humanity, including your jealousy and, and, and your rage and, and your feelings of deception or being deceived until you can find a state of forgiveness. And it takes time and practice and effort. The discipline of yoga, um, uh, tapas, spadhyaya, which is that self-study, um, it's not a passive practice. It's, an, it's, an, it's a verb. It's an action that we take in order to find self-realization and then integration. And it's only then that I can truly show up and meet you where you're at and know that where you're at is between you and God. How you come to a state of awareness is ultimately none of my business. My business is my response to your humanity and impatience around your growth. That to me is what the yoga is and what's leading us all into self-acceptance and into radical love. Wow. Thank you. One of the things that, that really I loved your descriptions of throughout the book was your, your tendency towards dissociation because of the trauma that you had experienced. And I think that this is such a common thing that you touch on in, in, for yoga practitioners and in yoga communities, the concept of vairagya or detachment is confused with this dissociation. And I know that Mona, who you describe in the book, <clears throat> who just sounded like such a wonderful woman, such a unique character, um, helped you to sort of get around the, the way you bypassed using that concept of detachment. Can you tell us about that? Sure, absolutely. And, and, and it is a really important subject because as a teacher, I witness it in other students a lot. And often they feel that a lofty goal within the practice of yoga is this idea of, of detachment. We're taught it. 
big feeling comes up, detach. We are not that big feeling, um, not to identify with those feelings. But detachment without true awareness is dissociation and avoidance. And we actually have to go, to, we have to orient towards that which we're trying to detach from and try to understand its, its energetic power um, when we understand the mind-body connection. So in the book, I share that I experienced um, childhood trauma in the form of sexual molestation. When that happened, I had a kind of classical out-of-body experience where I could witness what was happening to me, but I had no emotional relationship to it. And even when I shared the experience with my mom, her, she'll, she'll share about it now. What she couldn't understand was how devoid of emotion I was. I wasn't scared. I wasn't sad. I wasn't angry. I just told it as it was. And and kind of just moved on and uh, not understanding what was going on internally. When I experienced that moment, my body was no longer in my control. It was in someone else's control. My nervous system clamped down into my body in that moment, leaving like an, a real imprint. And that's trauma. Trauma is anything that overwhelms our capacity to cope and leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, out of control, or unable to respond. When we experience any kind of trauma, and trauma lives on a, on a spectrum, so what might be traumatic for me might not be tra traumatic for someone else and vice versa. But when we experience trauma, uh, messages move from the, the brain into the body, the body goes into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. In that moment, the body contracts out of self-preservation, control, and protection. And in yoga speak, a samskara is now imprinted into the body. Um, that would be like a, a deep groove of perception, of experience that's now very much alive within ourselves. If you were raised in an environment where your parents, let's say, recognized something happened. Now, maybe your trauma is bullying. Maybe it's death of a loved one. Maybe it's divorce. But if the parents are understanding that you're having a, uh, that fight flies, fight, excuse me, that, that um, fight, flight, freeze, or collapse experience, your parents might help you to process it by yelling, screaming, crying, um, somehow releasing the energy, because that's what it is. The trauma is an emotion. The emotion is subtle energy. Energy is vibration with information. So by yelling, screaming, crying, jumping, dancing, it releases that contraction, that tension, and allows for the energy to move. Now, it's not usually a one and done. It might take, you know, time, but that's often what happens, though, in families, even with the best of intentions. A child, like even like myself, might come and say, I'm scared, I'm sad, I'm overwhelmed. Parents who might not know what to do in the moment says, oh, I see you're scared. Here, have a cookie. Or I see you're sad. Let's go shopping. I'll buy you a present. So they find other ways to self to soothe rather than giving space for the rage, probably because they're, they haven't been taught that themselves. And if they're uncomfortable with their own shadow self, it's very hard for a parent to tolerate then the shadow self of their child. So what we learn though about trauma is that it's cumulative. So after my original traumatic experience, every time I had an experience that reminded my unconscious of the overpowerment, of the betrayal, of the fear, my body would contract. And that contraction, year after year after year, becomes tension. As a child, I don't know how to soothe that. Later in life, I figured it out via drugs and alcohol. But how I know now, that I was in a very deep traumatic, uh, my body was having a deep traumatic response was because I developed something called obsessive compulsive disorder. And I became obsessed at the time that wasn't diagnosed because that wasn't something that was really in the lexicon. I, you know, people didn't really talk about that. I just had these quirky behaviors. I had to touch things in fours and eights. It was blinking, swallowing, walking into things. Um, 
if someone touched me on one side, I had to figure out how to get them to touch me on the other side. I called it patterning. And I, in doing these patterns, my nervous system would calm down. If I didn't do these pat patterns, I had a very complicated and paranoid feeling that something bad was going to happen to someone that I loved, meaning that someone was going to die. This had a lot to do with the fact that the betrayal that I felt by God, I didn't know what God was, and I wouldn't have been conscious of this. All I knew was that in that moment of trauma, I was no longer safe and I wasn't protected. And that this thing that I was told would always take care of us from bad things, if we were good enough, abandoned me. And so as a little six-year-old kid, I knew then that God didn't exist and then began playing God, meaning that if I touch this thing four times, then I can prevent my mother from getting killed or, or dying. If I say I love you a certain amount of times, or if the blanket falls evenly on my body, if it didn't, the anxiety would go up and up and up. And so the only way to soothe that anxiety was through patterning. And so I had very clever ways of managing my anxiety. It didn't, it didn't really complicate my life. I had a, you know, a great upbringing, uh, popular in school, all that stuff. People knew I had these little quirky behaviors and indulged them, including my family. Uh, but internally, I was, a, I, I was scared and I was sad and I was frightened and I didn't know what to do with it. When I left home and away from the protection of my mother was when I turned towards drugs and alcohol and uh, to self-soothe. And that, it wasn't until I got into yoga and therapy, therapy at 18 helped me to understand that what I experienced at six and at other times in my life that I didn't actually write about in the book, the trauma wasn't just a, a one off. Um, there was, there was some consistent patterns. Um, but it was in that moment that I learned about trauma and that I learned about the mind body connection intellectually. And that I learned that first word dissociate, uh, excuse me, detach detach, kept coming up, big feelings, detach, big feelings, detach. And I thought I can do that. I know how to detach. What I learned in time, my detachment was spiritual bypassing. I used the language of yoga, including the phrase, everything happens the way it's supposed to in order for the soul to transform as a way not to actually have to orient towards the rage. Because if you can understand Remember when I said that those eight years of yoga were all physical because of all that tightness? That tension was my protection. My nervous system knew how to stay in control with that and protected as long as I was contracted. I can, it was almost like a chess game. I could be 10 moves ahead of impending danger. But what happens when you let go of that control? To me, it's, it's abuse. It's death. Yoga, when you're practicing and releasing the tension, the emotions that live under that tension start to come up to the surface and it's terrifying. And if you have, I hope, a skilled teacher that can really invite the student, like, stay in this. This is the magic. This is the yoga. This is the moment where your brain is going to want to do everything to self-soothe. You're going to want to fa fantasize. You're going to want to project. You're going to want to think about the bills you have to pay or the guy or whoever you used to go with, you know, in 1982 that you still have a resentment towards. Everything is going to come up because it has to. This is the liberation process. But when we're taught to detach and not identify with those big feelings, we're also being asked not to identify with our own humanity. My shadow is what brings me to my light. My anger is what's going to teach me compassion. My grief is what's going to teach me forgiveness. One can't happen without the other to a degree. And so spiritual bypass within the, the, the wellness world is a, a chronic uh, disease, if you will, that blocks people from their own potential because it invites a continued avoidance over what we perceive or what the world perceives as being unattractive, ugly, or unspiritual. And in the book, I explored a lot that the, 
Mona, through the work of Mona, helped me to recognize my dissociative patterns, helped me to learn how to get back into my body and not intellectualize my trauma or my emotions, meaning I can tell you how I feel, but I don't actually feel it. She taught me how to feel it. And it was not fun. I did not enjoy a second of it. I still don't enjoy it. My preference, the sensation of dissociation is so familiar that my preference is to lean into it because it feels safe. So it's work for me to have to force myself to go towards that discomfort, even though I know that that's the medicine and I know that that's where the liberation lives. Thank you. I, I, I'm wondering if we can touch on the chakra system because I, you know, I love the way you go into it in, in the book. And I think it's something that there's a lot of misunderstanding around just how profound of a physical, emotional, energetic, psychological system that it is. Can you just give sort of your overview of this, the chakra system and how we can work with it? Sure. Um, it, the chakra system is what changed my life. It gave me a roadmap in order to understand the intersection between our physical body, our emotions, and our energetic body, and how they're all in relationship. Um, so there's no separation between the mind and the body. The body remembers everything, historically, ancestrally, culturally. That information, like I said, lives in the body via some scars. And we even inherit our, some scars through our, um, our family, it, it lives within our DNA. That means that our samskaras influence our perception. So how I see the world is viewed through a lens where my unconscious is determining um, the interpretation of what I see, different than how you live your life or anybody else. So the chakras are vortices of electromagnetic energy that line the length of the spine. In the practice of yoga, there are seven major chakras that we work with, but in truth, there are countless chakras throughout the whole of the body. The chakras are invisible. You can't see them, but you can feel them. On a physiological level, there are nerves that move through our spine that communicate with different parts of our body. These nerves happen, the ganglias, the, the, the extenders, happen to be in the same location as the chakras, just so you can imagine that there actually is a physiological resonance between our nerve endings, so therefore our nervous system, and these invisible vortices of energy. The chakras spin at a very particular rate. When we are balanced, the chakras distribute prana or chi or energy through the body via what's called nadis. There are 76,000 nadis in our body. Now on a physiological level, if people can imagine what the vascular system looks like, you know, you, you've seen that this, the, the, the body stripped of skin, of muscle, and you can see the vascular system as a network, um, a roadway, if you will, very complicated. The nadis are very similar, except again, you cannot see them. In Eastern medicine, they use acupuncture or acupressure to release the blockages in the nadis to help to release the chi, the prana through the body. The theory being that the more that the prana or chi can flow, the healthier we can be physically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. These blockages, although sometimes they can be physiological, often these blockages are caused by emotional suppression. So what each chakra does, just like those nerve ganglias impact the certain parts of my anatomy, like the, the, the upper nerves are going to affect my arms, my, the, the way my head moves, etc. The, ch the chakras relate from density to expansion, from matter into consciousness. The denser energies relate to our relationship to the physical world and each other, and the higher of the vibrations relate to cosmic consciousness or our spiritual world. 
So for example, the first chakra, which is called the Muladhara chakra, which is located at the perineum or the base of the spine, the color is red, the element is earth. That chakra is our foundation, it is our root, it is about home, safety, security, um, boundaries. It's uh, the way in which we uh, ground ourselves upon this planet. When that chakra is blocked because of trauma, trauma that can include um, any major illness or surgery, birthing difficulties, poor bonding with your mother, um, death of a loved one. It can also include things uh, like racism, for example, genocide, um, war or uh, gang violence, things of that nature. Um, when that chakra is blocked, it, it impacts the body's ability to receive prana in the legs, the knees, the ankles, the feet, the lower part of the intestinal tract, the length of the spine, the bones, the teeth, the tongue. Um, so when someone is saying to me that they're very tight in their hamstrings or their quads, or even in portions of the hips, I'm going to look at their body on a physiological level and just see like, you know, okay, what's going on in their hamstrings? Are they dealing with any in injury? Is this just genetic? Is it in their bodies? Is it situational? But I might also wonder what else might be going on in their lives in this moment that is making their foundation or their structure feel fragile or um, uh, vulnerable. And that might be something that as I teach, I might plant seeds or use words like ground, feel the support of the earth beneath you, breathe into the tension in your legs. So you can go through all of the different chakras to get some insight into that interdependency. The second chakra is going to be related to sexuality and emotions, creativity. And of course, it impacts the hips and our sexual organs, um, as well as the kidneys um, and the lower part of the intestinal tract. The third chakra, which is the Manapura chakra, this one is so interesting to me because this is the seat of the soul. It's where we um, willpower, self-esteem, self-respect. Um, when we have a strong sense of who we are, it allows us to trust our intuitive knowing. This is often a point where we give away our power, where we identify with the outside world, meaning that my value is dependent upon how the world sees me. This affects the intestinal tract, um, the large and the small intestines, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, the gallbladder, the pancreas. Um, and so it's that point of insecurity, which so many of us suffer from. But if we have low self-esteem, we can't trust our intuition. And intuition is a, it, it's a, it's a skill. It's not a gift. It's a skill that only gets fractured because we forget who we truly are. And the reason we forget who we truly are is because of conditioning based on the constructs and the samskaras that live in our body that influence our perception. So that third chakra, it's like you gotta call that power back and develop self-confidence with a capital S to experience liberation. The heart chakra, love, compassion, all the juicy stuff live up here. But it also holds the shadow. Each chakra holds a shadow. The first is fear. The second is guilt. The third is shame. And the fourth, the anahata, is um, grief. Grief is a very positive uh, emotion. What this means, though, is unresolved grief, internalized grief, the unwillingness to let go of resentments. And so what we hold on to this chakra is deception, betrayal, abandonment. Um, uh, all that resentment impacts our arms, the breasts, the lungs, the scapula, the wrist, the hands, and portions of the shoulders. And then, of course, the throat chakra, the Vishuddha chakra, communication, um, lies. That's the shadow here. And that affects the neck, the shoulders, the jaw, the tongue, the teeth, the mouth. The Ajna chakra, this is interesting because, like I said, we're innately uh, intuitive. But we've also grown up in environments especially organized religion, 
where there's dogma attached to our relationship with spirituality, spirituality is creative. It's fluid. It's something that grows and expands and changes over time with experience. It's nothing that's ever fixed. So your perception of spirituality at 10 is different at 20, is different at 80. Um, and it's this evolutionary process. Sometimes in organized religions, they box it in, which thwarts our growth. It thwarts our curiosity. It thwarts our imagination and it blocks our intuition. Um, and that affects our eyes, uh, the central nervous system, our skin, uh, our hearing. And then the crown chakra, of course, that is that connective point between the physical body and cosmic consciousness. And it's where we warehouse prophetic thoughts and, and uh, prayer. It's where we develop a rapport with the divine. And if that's blocked, and that's blocked if all the other chakras are blocked. And if you're wondering, of course your chakras are blocked. You're in this human experience. You've experienced uh, trauma and racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and all the things. And that blocks that ability to stay open to truth and love, which leads to wisdom. And so when you're on your mat and you're doing the yoga practice and you're in a pose and the sensation is really uncomfortable, let's say pigeon pose, for example, and you're in your mind swearing at the teacher, or you're thinking about like the, the, the sex you're going to have or once had or might have again, whatever it is. Maybe it's in that moment where you recognize that your body is trying to speak to you. The sensation is the language of the body. Get in that sensation, stay present to that sensation and see what's underneath it, what emotion it elicits. First, it'll start with fidgeting then annoyance, usually anger, and in time, always what's beneath the anger or the fear is the grief. And that's when your body can finally begin to release that contraction and the prana can start to flow more thoroughly through the body. So that in kind of a nutshell is like my relationship to the chakras. And I, now to be clear though, I don't believe like when my father got kidney cancer, I was, my dad was a yoga teacher also. And so I was obsessed with why out of all the cancers in the world was my father's body available to this particular kind of cancer, kidney cancer, which is related to the second and third chakras. And I was like, all right, dad, let's go in there. Let's find out what has to be healed. Who needs to be forgive? Let's do this before you die. So you can clear that karma. And my dad had to say to me at one point that I don't necessarily, he, these are his words, that he doesn't necessarily believe that he, that cancer was manifested in his body because of a block in his chakra. And I wanted, I need to say that to everybody here, because there's a lot of people who then think, oh, well, I have breast cancer. That must mean that my heart chakra is blocked and I caused this. Um, and I don't believe that. Like my father's cancer, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. Sometimes it's just, it's environmental. What my dad did say though, was that although he did not believe that his cancer was related to a block in the chakra, he did believe his cancer was an answer to a prayer because he prayed in his lifetime to open his heart and to get really present to himself and to his family and to show up as the father he always wanted to be. And for him, it took cancer and him facing death for him to be able to show up in the way he always dreamed of. And so he chose to look at illness in that way. Um, and so I just wanted to say that because I would never want people thinking that they cause their diseases. What the, what the chakra system does is though gives us a point of inquiry because why not? Why not just do the work regardless of the end results, but do it as a way just to get free of anything that's binding us to that story without bypassing it. Thank you, Sean. That's such a, a wonderful overview and, and such a good caveat for everybody to remember too. Uh, you know, I actually, I actually, I just want to remind our audience that Sean's going to be taking some of your questions. So feel free to type them into the Q and A tab on zoom and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can in a few minutes. I actually wrote down, um, the quote of what your dad 
said to you um, before he passed away. Can I share that? Sure, sure. It's so yeah. beautiful. Uh, Sean's dad said to her, one day, if you ever write a book, tell them you got this from your dying dad. Love big, forgive always, do good, and don't be an asshole. That's yoga. That's a life well lived. It's really that simple. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. My dad was a complicated man. Very often people come and they, they hear about my dad and they, you know, they think he was, he was incredibly wise, but he was human like everybody. And there was a reason my father was doing yoga. And I think when my father said those words to me, they were, a much, they were as much to him as they were to me um, because he did his best and, and I live my life in that and. I do my best and. But I took those words to heart. When my father was dying, it was, it was uh, as anyone who's experienced that level of loss to be present to it. And my dad was, was young. He was 67 years old when he died. Um, and he was, a, he, was, he was very philosophical with me, especially because we could be, because we shared this practice. And that, that final story in the book was one of the harder, harder stories to write to share because it was so intimate. And yet I hope it brings a lot of comfort to people who are, um, who are standing at that precipice, precipice of saying goodbye. And I took those words to heart and I live by that. I try to, I try to love big. I try to do good. I try to forgive always. And I try and fail every single day not to be an asshole. And I do remember that it is that simple. Like if you are following those, those, those four philosophies, life can be better for us and for everyone that we, we approach. Um, but I appreciate you sharing um, that quote and bringing my, my dad into the space. Um, to this day, I miss him very, very much. And I'm always, I always welcome any opportunity to hear his words reflected back to me. Sean, maybe, maybe we can just change gears a little bit before we get to the audience questions. One of the things I really wanted to ask you about that's a theme throughout the book is uh, privilege. Privilege and, and power structures and power dynamics, both within yoga communities and in the world at large. Um, I, I, I'm wondering specifically today if we can talk about yoga communities and how privilege, how you're seeing in yoga communities how privilege or power dynamics are playing out? I mean, I, I lived it on a professional level. I honestly, quite frankly, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been able to get a book deal. I wouldn't be in a, in a position of authority if it wasn't because, especially at that time in the 90s, the color of my skin, the shape of my body, um, and the marketability of my face, I, everything about me when I was in my 20s, especially, uh, that's, that's privilege, that's power. I wasn't a better yoga teacher than anyone else, but I got opportunities that others wouldn't get, and they might not get it because of the color of their skin or the size or shape of their body, or perhaps because they weren't fitting into some kind of a marketable um, construct uh, that was going to sell leggings or whatever it may have been. That trickles down into everything um, and into who gets the best time slots, who gets to make more money, who gets to own a yoga school, who gets access to the resources. And so we see that it's changing. Uh, it's evolving very much so since the 90s. Um, I remember when I, I got my first DVD, I saw the traje trajectory of where my career was going. Like I saw like, for me, this was gonna be pretty easy. Like I was gonna make a living, who thought? Like I didn't see that coming. But yet once I got on that train, I realized like, I'm going to be okay. But in those moments, because I'm a yoga student 
And I also recognize that again, yoga is now a mirror is being held up where God is saying to me like, honey, this is a, your own yoga. This is ego. There's so much projection, so much hype. If you lean into that comfortably, the lessons that you're going to have to learn are going to be so huge. Why don't you just go into it with a little bit more of awareness, like write down what the lessons might be if you buy this hype, or can you use the privileges that you've been given and the opportunities that you have to redirect people's attention off of me personally, which quite frankly, isn't that interesting, but onto things that are, that I might be able to communicate. That's using privilege in a way that raises awareness. As I got more successful in the field and was able to have enough confidence with the relationships that I had, let's say uh, a company wanted to work with me, wanted me to go and do a conference, let's say. I was able to leverage my power by saying like, yes, I'll come, but I'm noticing that you only have two people of color that are also here on your faculty. I'm not going to come unless you're willing to expand your, the, the, the representation within the yoga community um, and leverage my power that way. In time, it was actually even more important for me not to show up at all that my presence at certain festivals actually created a vacuum. And that didn't allow other yoga teachers to be able to elevate professionally. The only way for that elevation to happen is that I actually had to deliberately take myself out of the game in order to create space. That, because again, I'm a student of this, I'm always questioning my attachments, my identifications, um, my ego. And then no matter how uncomfortable it is, trying hard to extract myself away from the pull of it and dealing with whatever might come up. There's a lot of very young yoga teachers out there, right, out, out there teaching, as I once was, whose sense of self is very much determined by the way in which the world sees them, including their students, uh, you know, this community, who might not have the skills to, um, to understand that power privilege dynamic and hold on tight to their roles. And so as an elder in the community, it is my job to model it back and to talk about it and to encourage, um, the, to, to com encourage all of us to recognize that it's not a yoga community, it's communities of yoga. And there needs to be a myriad of different kinds of teachers trans teachers, queer teachers, um, teachers of color, big teachers, tiny teachers, all of it that speak to the myriad of students that are out there that are going to exhale in the presence of representation that looks like them. And it's really up to, um, it's up to those of us in power, and that includes the corporations, um, to recognize that if you're not actively doing the work to end this kind of oppression, then you are engaging in the systems that create this oppression. And therefore, you're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. And I, God knows I've been part of the problem. But I've also worked hard to, A, take accountability, create more space, take accountability for my, for the ways in which I've used my own unconscious power and privilege to better myself. And as a result to, uh, deny other people, some uh, visibility. Um, and at this stage in the game, recognizing that there are amazing yoga teachers who now speak to the different work that's happening now that I'm seeing in the yoga community, the anti-racist work that's happening is quite extraordinary. Um, teachers really helping all of us to engage in a language for us to understand that, again, I can't be free unless we're all free and that our liberation is bound and that that is what the yoga practice is all about. And that there are incredible teachers doing that work all through Canada. There are amazing teachers here in the United States, throughout the world. And that teachers like me need to get out of the way a bit. So to create more space for those teachers. So yeah, these power and privilege dynamics exist. It's real. 
Uh, we are all, um, for lack of a better phrase, guilty of it in different ways. But the moment that we embrace, again, it's a samskara. If I say I am not, uh, if I say, if you, if I say I'm not racist or I'm not sexist or homophobic or transphobic, that's a lie. In theory, I don't believe that of myself, but my body comes from a culture that has where the imprint of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and otherizing exists. It's in my body. So in a moment of fear or overwhelm, my mind, the rational part of my mind is going to shut off. The sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in and I'm going to time travel to a belief that lives in my body. And in that moment, it'll be real. That fear will be real. I will make a choice that excludes, that divides, that causes pain. The moment I know that that's true, then when I'm in that overwhelm, I know how to breathe. I know how to ground. I know how to take a moment to check in with my nervous system and then maybe make a different choice. So this is, I, I love the question. It's a deep question. It's profound. Um, and I think in the contemporary yoga world, these are the questions that we, especially as a white person, a white person of privilege, these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves again and again and again, not as an avoidance of the spiritual practice, but as an intrinsic part of it. Um, we weren't having these conversations uh, in the mainstream yoga world, you know, as, as normally as we're having it now, three years ago, five years ago. Um, now it's becoming way more commonplace that these, th this, this information is being imprinted in the same way we're asking ourselves to forgive our ex-partner for whatever they did to us. We're also being asked to forgive ourselves from the internalized um, uh, uh, white supremacy or oppression that we've experienced or implicating onto other people and find ways in which to heal it so that we can transcend it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a very uh, in-depth answer and a lot to digest there. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's some really good audience questions rolling in. I just wanted to check in with you before we keep going. We've just got about six minutes left. If we, if we need to go a few minutes extra, does that work for you? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. I'm cool. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Lara who says, Hi, Sean. Wow. Thank you for your insights, for sharing your growth, for recognizing the truth of your own being. Question. Are you following the yogic life in every way? Pranayama, Shavasana, vegetarian diet, meditation, and asanas every day? Is this required to get to your level of transformation? Um, yes, I follow uh, my, as best as I can. I am committed to the eight limb path of yoga. And I do my best and fail every day in my commitment to my yoga path. The easiest parts for me are asana, which I do do almost every day. I mean, there are days where, you know, I might miss. I don't beat myself up about that the way I used to. But that's also part of my own medicine because of, um, again, OCD and perfectionism go hand in hand. And uh, stuff comes up for me when I don't practice. Uh, that's actually more important for me to look at. And so if, uh, but most days I do some kind of practice. I listen to my body. So my practice is not um, imposed. Some days I want to work more in a way that's more challenging. Other days it needs, needs to be more nourish, nourishing and nurturing. So every day I practice asana, every day I meditate, um, Every day within the practice of meditation, I am focusing and concentrating and trying to get the clutter, you know, to still the mind and quiet. I do practice the yamas and the niyamas, again, to the best of my ability. I'm a vegan in my diet, very committed to being an ethical vegan. So it goes beyond my diet. Um, uh, I am uh, monogamous in my relationships, which is also, again, a part of it. Monogamy is not necessarily a part of brahmacharya it's being in right relationship with your sexuality so for me as long as you and whoever you're in engagement with are honest open consensual and there then you're in right relationship with your sexuality for me it, it it's about monogamy and uh uh 
having a profound intimacy within my, my partnership. And uh, that's how it shows up in my experience. So I always want to, I like to preface that because otherwise it sounds too rigid and sexuality is on a huge spectrum and um, really does need to be different for each person. Um, but in, again, in right relationship with self. So uh, yeah, I would have to say I'm committed to it. And uh, you know, what's to say like in 10 minutes after this is over, I'm going to go downstairs and my partner is going to do something that's going to annoy me. And I'm not going to say something really passive aggressive and, you know, kind of undermining. There's a really good chance that could happen. The difference is I'm going to catch myself. It might not happen immediately, but it's going to happen where I'm going to go back and say like, Hey, that wasn't cool. And I'm really sorry. I can do better. Um, so I think that when you do the work consistently, the rate in which we stay in our assholeness, if you will, bringing my dad back in here, gets shorter and shorter. And that to me, if I can live a life of taking accountability for my humanity and not expect perfection, then I do think that that's a life fairly well lived. Um, otherwise, we're going to be just hiding out in a cave and denying our, the, our impulse if I didn't experience anger, if I didn't experience fear, I'd be enlightened and I'm not enlightened. I'm angling towards that. But do I think that's going to happen in this lifetime? Oh, hell no. This is lifetimes of deep work. And so I take enlightenment off the table. That means that I also have to put my own humanity back on the table and look at that. But yes, I am very committed to my yoga practice because of my obsessive compulsive disorder. Because of my trauma, what I have learned is that when I don't do yoga, the some scars in my body run deep and they show up as anxiety and I will act out, um, not really through patterning, but there will be other ways. Um, my acting out is usually, um, I'm confront I can be confrontational and angry. Um, I channel it in my activism. I don't want that to show up in my relationships. And so I know then I have to, or victimize, you know, third chakra is like, you're going to do one or the other power over power under. And so that's my commitment is to my practice, uh, you know, daily in a variety of different ways. Thank you. There's, there's a couple of people were asking uh, a basic question, both, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Catherine and uh, Ashlyn. Uh, they were both asking about resources on where to learn more in depth about the chakra system. Well, uh, of course they can go to my book, um, uh, <laughs> revolution, <Yes>. <laughs> revolution of the soul. I just yes. blanked on the name of my book. I talk about every mind, body connection, trauma, the chakras, all of that. But quite frankly, on a day of Judith, the wheels of life, and even uh, you want to get that as kind of like your baseline. But her book, Eastern Body, Western Mind, changed my life. Do you have that back there somewhere? I don't have Eastern Body, Western Mind. I've got Wheels of Life on the shelf there. Yeah. Get, get Eastern Body, Western Mind, because Anadea Judith, Judith is also a psychologist. She was the first person that helped me. I had been in therapy, you know, I've been in therapy all my life or since I was 18. She was the first one, though, that helped me to understand that connection between the chakras and our psychology and really put it in words. Um, so for those of you who want a resource, definitely get those two books. You can also, she has all sorts of workshops and stuff online. Um, she was instrumental in my interpreting the chakras the way that I do and being able to heal myself by giving me that roadmap. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, and this one's from Catherine, who says, you talk a lot about oppressive systems in your book and how you can start by changing yourself and people in order to change systems. When working and serving for a system that is putting emphasis against a lot of your moral truth, how would you protect yourself from burnout or how would you professionally manage the system's oppression? Ooh, it's a hard one. And, you know, again, it's like the human part of me, I'd be like, quit, get out, you know? Um, don't put yourself there. Like, why would you want to be there? And 
thank God you're there. Thank God that there's people of some consciousness willing to go into those impressive, oppressive environments where the systems are in place to perpetuate um, inequality in any capacity or, or abuse. To be able to manage to stay in that in those environments without burnout or without just developing a true distaste for human beings, um, community, support, a place where you're going to be able to process the therapy, the program. Um, you have to be able to not isolation. Um, you're already probably psychically isolated enough as it is but a place where you can just go and say the things. Um, and, and even if they're the shadow things, the, if I'm in an environment where I feel like the life force is being sucked out of me, I want to hear from myself. What is it that, like, what am I holding? So I'll say, I'm going to, you know, that motherfucker, I, I hate them. I'll use words that I would never say to another person to their face. I will use the words that are alive in my body like hate. Because if it's there, it's there. So I might as well get it out in the privacy of my room, in my journal writing. I might write, this is what Mona taught me how to do in what's called rinsing. I, let's, I, I don't know the name of the, the company that you, may, you might be working for, but I might write, or the person you're working for, but dear, and then write their name, and then write a, what's called a fuck you letter. And you say all the nasty, unconscious things. Don't let spirituality get in your head. Don't let that little part be like, oh, but they're just in trauma. They're just in pain. They're really a good person. Get rid of it. Purge it. Next thing you do is everywhere where you wrote fuck you to that person, you cross at that you and you put me and reread it so that you can begin to identify parts of yourself that are replicating some of those behaviors in your own life. This will help you to find some understanding about why people do what they do and how hard it is to break those habits. Why would, we, why would we expect other people to be different or the systems to be different when we are replicating those behaviors, even if it's on a smaller scale? So I would use it as a way to purge the energy to see if I can find some commonalities. Then I write, I'm angry because, and purge it. I'm scared because, purge it, until I can get down to I'm sad because, and then let myself move into the tears. The tears are the things that are going to help us to become more empathetic. Empathy is what changes the world. Not sympathy, not um, sympathy, there's another one I can't remember, but empathy is when it's I'm feeling like with you, not for you. And that can only happen when we're seeing similarities in our collective shadow, uh, none of us are better than. We all participate in these systems. So if I was in that environment, I would purge, process, get therapy, find community, but also see where does this mirror my own behaviors and what do I have to do actively to transform that which is in with me that I can't tolerate within these systems. I hope that made sense. Uh, and that was how it I think that it did. It made sense for me. I, I thought that that was a, a wonderful answer and very helpful, but I don't know where, where, um, where Catherine is coming yeah. from. So, yeah. Uh, Sean, you mentioned before we came live that you, you know, the, this, the war with Russia invading Ukraine and that in your processing call uh, that you hosted this morning for people that there's a lot coming up and people not sure what to do with that. And I think that is something that is going on for a lot of people. Um, would you be willing to lead us through a short meditation or prayer uh, to close? Sure, of course I would. Um, yeah, I, I want to say, like going back to that first chakra, we as a collective are in a first chakra crisis. The, the invasion is in, in the Ukraine is letting us know that we're not safe, that the ground upon which we thought we thrived the rug has been ripped out from underneath us. We're witnessing it in real time. And if it can happen over there, we know in our hearts there is no over there. Um, it, it's showing how fractured our society is, how unfair, how unjust, how vulnerable it is to power dynamics. Um, that's a very scary place to be. 
and it's in our bodies. It wouldn't be a surprise if today people feel fatigued, they yawn a lot, if their legs feel heavy or dense or sore for no reason, or if their lower back hurts um, or their digestion is off. These are often symptomatic of internalizing the rage that we feel, um, the concern that we have, um, and the helplessness that we're experiencing. Um, and I think it's important first for people to recognize, take the moment to say, to check in with their bodies, to just to ask themselves a question like, am I okay? So let's start there. So I'm going to invite you all to sit up tall and close your eyes. If it's appropriate, you might be listening to this in a car. So if that's the case, do not close your eyes. If you can, if you're sitting in a chair, try to have your feet on the floor so that you feel some connection with the earth beneath you. Otherwise, just feel into the sit bones. And as you ground down, feeling into this incredible planet that we all inhabit and share, this planet, planet that is vibrant with regeneration and creation, that regardless of where we exist within the world, energetically, there is no boundary. There's no states or continents or countries. A literal invasion is a psychic invasion. And it reminds our soul of these divides that are constructs and hurting all of us and keeping us from that recognition of wholeness that unites us as one. So bring your awareness down to the Muladhara chakra at the very base of the spine. Feel into the knowing that you are here now in your body. The world supports you. You have what you need. And as you ground down, elongate through the spine and bring your awareness to the heart center, the Anahata chakra. And allow this space to expand, feeling perhaps some warmth within your body. Love is not what we are becoming. It is our essential nature. It's who we are and what it is we are awakening to. We recognize that there is no other. And our hearts grieve for the suffering, the displacement, the pain that citizens are experiencing right now in this very moment whom we may not be bonded by blood, although some of you here may be, but we are bonded by spirit, by God. Open your heart to these beings in the Ukraine who in this moment are fighting for their liberty, for their freedom, for their independence, for their lives. Open your heart to the people, the citizens of, of Russia, who right now are demonstrating and prote protesting and putting their own lives at risk because they recognize that what is being done is wrong. Feel into your own grief or your own avoidance of what's happening in this moment. And allow yourself to be in present time to this reality. Because we know within the unconscious that our liberation is bound. Bring your awareness to the very top, or rather to your third eye center, the Ajna Chakra. Keep your eyes closed, but turn your eyeball straight to that center point. 
we are here in these bodies to awaken to the power of love, to embrace that love, to embody it, to surrender to its power and to its call. Our intuition knows who we are beyond our fear, beyond our trauma, beyond these constructs. Open your mind to that truth and trust the guidance that is inviting you into self-recognition. For the recognition of self is the recognition of all. And now bring your awareness to the very top of the head to the Sahasrara chakra, that connect the point between your physical body and cosmic consciousness to God as it lives within and beyond and receive. Remember who you are and who we are to each other. Remember the work that we must do in order to show up and ease this world towards peace. That each and every one of us are called and to share the depthful aspect of being that we can only find when we return home. So come home and remember. And then place your palms into prayer, calling in that God of your understanding, we ask, may this moment together be blessed. May we commit to doing the inner work necessary to confront our own limited beliefs and take accountability for our humanity so that we can orient towards the world. And especially in the face of conflict and in crisis, we can remain grounded and present and do what needs to be done in order to together create a world that is free and fair and equal and safe and happy and healthy for all beings everywhere. We ask you, dear God, to surround the Ukrainian people with your light and with your love and protect them from this moment in time and to give us all as global citizens the strength to do what we can do in order to create ease and safety and happiness to all communities whom are oppressed. We ask, may there be peace. Take another very deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. And lower your chin to your chest. Open your eyes. And inhale. Come up. Thank you all, wherever you are in the world in this moment, so much from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this conversation today. I send you all so many blessings, great health, and may your whole life continue to be blessed in all ways, always. Sean Korn, on behalf of the whole Banyan Books community, thank you so much. Everyone, we've been speaking to Sean Korn and her, her book is called uh, revolution of the soul and it just came out in paperback and uh, just wishing everyone a beautiful day thank you thanks for joining us for branches of wisdom a podcast of banyan books and sound canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970 our podcast producer is jacob Steele. the show is edited by abdo habani and I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.